In this video, we'll be defining the trigonometric functions and looking at how to solve basic trigonometric equations. I thought I would start with a problem that is hopefully quite familiar to you. That's this one here. So you're given a right triangle and you're asked to find the angle. So it says find the value of theta and you're given two sides. This side is opposite with relation to this angle and we're also given the hypotenuse. Hopefully you know that you need to use the trigonometric ratios. So which ratio would you use here? With the opposite side and the hypotenuse, we need to use the sine ratio. So we say sine of theta equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. The opposite side is one, the hypotenuse is two, so we get sine of theta equal to a half. And here to solve for the angle, we take advantage of the fact that throughout history, mathematicians have found all of the angles for all possible ratios. And what we put into our calculator is the inverse sine of a half to find that angle. Uh, you might also know the exact value of sine theta equal to a half. And so we get an answer here for the angle of 30 degrees. So we know theta equals 30 degrees. Okay, great. Let's look at the second example. The second example says, find the possible values of theta given that sine of theta equals a half. The reason I went through this first example is when we start learning about trigonometry, we learn about these ratios in right triangles, the sine, cosine, and tan ratios. We learn about Sokotoa and how the angle relates to the ratio of the sides. This is a nice way to start because you only have to consider the one possible answer to this equation, sine theta equals a half. Um, because you know the angle must be acute, it's within a right triangle. But actually this equation by itself, sine theta equals a half, has infinitely many solutions. So this problem here, we're going to get infinitely many solutions. So before I answer this question, let's take a quick look at the unit circle to understand where these solutions come from. So here we have the unit circle. It's a unit circle because the radius is one, here we see that the circle intersects the y-axis at 0, 1 and the x-axis at 1, 0. Uh, we could draw a right triangle in here. So this is the radius, so the hypotenuse will be 1. And we have some angle here between the x-axis and the hypotenuse of theta. And we're going to think about this point where the radius intersects the circle. We're going to think about the coordinates of that point. What are the coordinates? Well, we can use our trig ratios. So the sine of theta would be the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So if we call that A, for example, sine of theta would be A over 1. In other words, sine theta equals A. Or, reverse that, A equals sine theta. So the, the length of this line is sine theta. Or also we could think of that as the y-coordinate of this point. So the y-coordinate of that point on the circle is sine theta. Now we could draw a congruent right triangle reflected in the y-axis. So the angle is the same in there between the x-axis and the hypotenuse. And we could think about this point on the circle reflected in the y-axis. Well, we know the heights will be the same, they're congruent triangles. So this point also has a y-coordinate of sine theta. But if we measure the angle of rotation from the x-axis anti-clockwise, um, so that's an important point. The angle is measured anti-clockwise from the x-axis. And you might wonder why we measured the angle anti-clockwise. Uh, there's a really great video by James Tanton all about the history of the unit circle, which I'll link in the description where it explains why we do this. Um, but maybe you can figure out why we might measure the angle uh, anti-clockwise from the x-axis. A bit of a clue, instead of thinking of this as positive y, in the positive y direction, you can think of this as north and this is east. So why do you think we might measure the, the angle going this way? It's a bit of a giveaway. But anyways, we have this point here. The y coordinate is sine theta, but our angle of rotation is no longer theta. Um, what would that angle be? Well, a full rotation to the other side of the x-axis is... 180 degrees. So this angle in blue is going to be 180 take theta. So we could also think of the y coordinate of this point as sine of 180 take theta. So here we have that sine theta equals sine of 180 take theta, right? Because now we're thinking of sine theta not as a ratio, but as the y coordinate of this point as it travels around the circle. Also, you can think of that as the length or the height of that point above the x axis. Okay, we could also think about if we go all the way around the circle. So starting at that x-axis and rotating all the way around and getting back again to this point. So how many degrees have I rotated? Well, that would be 360, the full rotation of a circle, plus theta. 
and we get back to that point, again we have uh, that point being sine theta and 360 plus theta. So we get another equation here, we can say sine of theta equals sine of 360k plus theta. k being any integer because we could keep rotating around, so we can multiply that by 2 or 3, and we'd still get the same y coordinate there, right? Um, or the same height above the x-axis. So we have these two equalities, and that means that we're going to get infinitely many solutions. You can imagine this point traveling around and around, and we always get back to the same points, um, so we have infinitely many solutions um, if we say, for example, sine theta equals a half. So we can see that we can define the trigonometric functions for any angle, not just angles less than 90 degrees. And you can also graph this relationship between, uh, you know, the y coordinate of this point or the height above the x-axis and the angle of rotation. So if you draw this on a graph, the angle is now the x-axis or the, uh, the independent variable and sine theta is the dependent variable. So you can see, uh, well, what would this, what would the y coordinate be when we start at one zero? That would be zero, right? Y is zero. In other words, this point is one zero. So we start at zero. As this angle increases up to 90, it's going towards one. So we can see in this graph, it goes up, 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 up to 90 degrees, and we get that point one ninety degrees. And then as the angle increases again up to 180, that height above the x-axis or this point is decreasing down to zero again. And then as we keep going around the circle to 270 degrees, we get to negative one on the y-axis. So we get that point negative one, 270 degrees. And then up to 360 degrees, we go back to zero. And then we get this repeating pattern as the point travels around the circle. And we get this nice wave. So this is a graph of the sine function, uh, also sometimes called the sine wave for obvious reasons. Okay, then we can think about cosine of theta. That's this length in here, or the, the x coordinate of that point. Um, so again, using the trig ratios, you can see this length in here would be cosine theta. So the x coordinate of that point is cosine theta. And you can also graph that relationship. So if we start that point down here at one zero, we can see the cosine of zero degrees is one. So the cosine graph starts at one and goes down to zero when it gets to 90 degrees, we have an x coordinate of zero. Then at 180, it's at negative one. Then 270, it's zero again. Then 360, it's back to one and we get that repeating pattern for the cosine graph. Um, and also you can think of that as a translation to the left 90 degrees of sine theta. Um, lastly, let's think about the tangent function. If you want to think about that in terms of the unit circle, the tangent is this length from that point to the x-axis. So it's the length of that, that part of the tangent, which is 90 degrees to the radius. Um, so let's think about what this would be when we start at one zero, what would the tangent, what would the length of that line B from that point to the x-axis, it'd be zero, right? So the tangent function or the graph of the tangent function starts at zero. Then what's going to happen to this length as that line moves towards 90 degrees? Well, it's increasing, increasing, increasing. When the point's about here, you can imagine that line would be really, really long. So we can get really large values for the tangent function when the point or the angle of rotation is near 90 degrees. What about when the point gets to 90 degrees? That tangent would be horizontal to the x-axis. So what would the length be? Well, we say it's undefined. Well, it has essentially infinite length, um, or it never actually intersects with the x-axis. When the angle of rotation is 90 degrees, um, it's going to be parallel to the x-axis. So we get this graph for the tangent function. We see we have uh, asymptotes at 90 degrees, 270 degrees, 450 degrees, where the, the point on the circle is at zero one or zero negative one, because that tangent is uh, parallel to the x-axis. Um, so that's the graph of the tangent function. It's not limited to uh, the range of negative one to one as sine and cosine are. And there you go. So 
that's how we are now defining the trigonometric functions. Um, it's much more useful way to think about uh, sine, cosine, and tan uh, because now we can solve these types of equations that we looked at before. Okay, so let's go back to our example. Actually, just before we do that, there's a bit more terminology that we need. So um, it's useful to think of these quarters of circles to give them names. So the first one we call the first quadrant, then we have the second quadrant, third quadrant, and fourth quadrant. Just a quick example of why this is useful. For example, the, the sine function is positive in the first and second quadrants, and the cosine function is positive in the first and fourth quadrants. Okay, back to the example. So now we want to answer this. We want to come up with all of the solutions, not just this one solution between 0 and 90. We can start with the unit circle, and let's think about this point and what this equation is telling us. It's saying sine of theta equals a half. So remember what with how we're uh, defining sine theta now, we're thinking of that as the y-coordinate of this point. So if sine theta equals a half, the y-coordinate of this point is one half. Um, so then we could draw the radius in and think about that angle of rotation. That's what we're looking for, which is theta. Well, we've already answered this question in part. We came up with this theta equals 30 degrees. This is what we now call the reference angle. Okay, so we know that theta equals 30 degrees. That's our reference angle. And we know we're going to get another solution, as we just talked about, over here in the second quadrant. Because, again, sine theta equals a half in that second quadrant. So it's the y coordinate of that point as well over here. Um, and we know that that angle of rotation is 180 take theta or 150 degrees. Okay, so we've got two possible answers now. We've got 30 degrees and 150 degrees. And we also need to consider if we go all the way around, so this entire angle, 360 plus 30. Um, so that set of solutions we can write as theta equal to 30 degrees plus 360k. Okay, so that's uh, every time this point gets back to this point in the first quadrant, 30 plus 360k. Then this point we can write as 150 degrees plus 360k, where k is any integer. So there you go, that is solving a basic trigonometric equation. And we could check this with our calculator. So plug in into your calculator something like sine of 390 degrees. That would be 30 plus 360. And you'll see that you get one half. Okay, so in the next few videos, I'll be looking at some more complicated trig equations um, and getting into this in more detail. So I hope you found that helpful. As a start to solving trigonometric equations and defining the trig functions, please leave a like if you did, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.